Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 22nd. Our topic today is digital citizenship. Our special guest is Steve Garten. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Susie Higley, who will now introduce Steve and ask him the newbie question. Well, I really appreciate that last question because that is how I met Steve at a parent workshop uh, here in the area. He is such a dynamic speaker and I loved his message. He talked about the positive things that all this technology has led with kids and also some of the cautions. And common sense media is such an important part of education for many people. I use their lessons so much in my library and I just loved him as a presenter. He has such an interesting background too. You may have heard of the Maine when they had the one-to-one -one initiative. Steve was a part of that. He's been a teacher, a technology director. He was part of the Smarter Balanced uh, Committee and led the technology readiness and assessment part of that. He works for Common Sense now in Ohio, so we're fortunate. He comes to Indiana quite a bit. He's spoken at our Indiana Connected Educators Conference. And as I said, I got to see him at that parent workshop. I was so impressed and contacted him and said, please, would you do a workshop for Classroom 2.0 Live? So I'm delighted that he's here. And those of us who've been on since before the hour have already experienced his humor. So I'm so glad to welcome him today to the program. Thank you very much. And I think humor is, of course, a relative term. Um, my daughters always have the same question they keep asking. Mom, is that supposed to be funny? So, so forgive me if I do di diverge or digress. And here's the newbie question. How has student technology use in the digital age changed parenting? And I think, I mean, we could obviously go on for an hour about this, but the short answer is that technology is really changing the entire future as far as what our kids are going to be able to do. And for them to have jobs as they're moving forward, for them to be able to fit in, the digital technology is, is, is a pervasive, very prevalent part of their life that we really have to embrace and, and provide them access to as opposed to being able to isolate them like we could before. I live in southern Ohio. I work in San Francisco. I spend most of my time talking to somebody from Maine. So it really wouldn't matter where I live to be able to do my job. And as more and more of those jobs come in. So I think by embracing the digital technology and helping our kids to understand what they need to do and, and how they can use this positively and effectively, um, we'll really be able to provide them the opportunity to both stay at home when we live in areas that sometimes see our, our industries moving and changing, and also being able to have them be successful in what is now truly a global world and the global economy as they're working forward. So I see a lot of positive things, but I do see it also changes completely the way that we're able to to do this because we don't know. We don't know what what's out there and we're sort of learning along with them as this happens. So welcome everybody. And we'll turn it over to you for your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and by a feel free, throw things into the chat windows for going questions. We'll capture those as we're going. Today we're going to have to talk about parenting in the digital age. And I know we're educators for the most part that are here, but we're sort of looking at it from the, the parent point of view because as educators we are parents and we're also acting in loco parentis at school as we're doing this. So, so today I'm really looking at this from the, the parent side um, and really sort of teacher-student relationship also, but from the parent point of view. So my background, don't hold the Smarter Balance thing against me. Um, I was the first two years co-chair of the, of the Smarter Balance Consortium going forward. And, and I think Common Core sort of bounced around all kinds of ways, a lot of political fallout from that. But I do like the conversation that's happened around that and the fact that we do have a lot more resources now that, are, that we can use going forward. And, and I think we now have a national conversation about education where before it's been it's been, uh, you know, sort of localized as we're going through this. So our kids, very, very different future. Um, I, I, I came from Maine where, uh, you know, we have the kids there. I've been spending a lot of time working with West Virginia. Um, and in both of those areas, 
the students really don't have an opportunity to have a job close to home anymore. The coal industry is, is going down. The timber industry is going down. So for our kids to have the, the choice to be able to stay in their home, we really need to provide them with this technological infrastructure so that they'll be able to have the choice if they want to stay home. And I think that's been a very powerful message as we're going forward, um, you know, thinking about these digital resources and what we're using. I'm, I'm with Common Sense. Common Sense actually piloted some of their early stuff when I was up with Maine since we had that large one-to-one -one footprint for them to try this. Um, I love working for Common Sense because Common Sense people either love us or don't know us. Our resources are free, so anything I talk about today you'll be able to use for free, both as parents and as educators, and uh, we're just excited to be here today. A lot of people don't know, though, that Common Sense has three branches. We have Common Sense Media, that's our rating and review section. We'll talk a little bit about that. We have Common Sense Education, which is um, we also rate educational apps, and we provide our digital citizenship curriculum, as well as uh, some new privacy initiatives that we have going on. And then we also have an advocacy arm called Common Sense Kids Action. And that's where uh, the legislative branch, especially active in California since we've been there, they're really pushing forward on the agenda of digital citizenship and student privacy and safety that's, that's uh, been going forward. So our three, uh, three arms, you can get to all three of those from the same page. We'll mostly focus on the education and the media part today, but just know that it's all there. Some really interesting, exciting stuff, and I'm proud to be part of the organization. Today we're really talking about the digital citizenship piece. And for me, the key here is it's digital citizenship, not internet safety. To be a citizen of a country, really, you have to be born there or you have to take some really long, hard, involved test. And most of us, um, we're not born digital citizens, so we have to sort of take the test and figure out what's going on and do things. But our kids were born there. But just because they're born in the digital age, does not mean that they are good citizens. To be a good citizen of the country, we have to have instruction and, and figure out how to vote, our responsibilities for voting, and, and being able to live in a society. And it's the same online. So digital citizenship really encompasses the whole piece and not just the internet safety piece. I want to start with a couple of uh, research things that Common Sense has done. Common Sense is very strong in the research, um, the research piece of what's going on. And, and one of some of the first things we found is that is that um, tweens and teens really do a lot of stuff. So this eye chart here is really just to tell you we've defined a tween as 8 to 12 and a teen from 13 to 18. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this, in this research paper if you'd like to, to look at it. But what we found is the average time spent not including school or homework by a teen is almost nine hours a day. And by tweens, it's almost six hours a day. Now, please note that that's not necessarily consecutive times, because I know my daughter's on her phone, which as far as I know, she's never actually made a phone call on it. Um, at the same time, she's watching television, at the same time that she's, she's um, on her computer doing those kind of things. So sometimes these things happen consecutively as they're moving along, but that is a lot of time that they're spending out there when they're doing that. The thing that, that struck me when we looked at this is that when you break this down to the tweens and teens, the 26% of the teens that spent more than eight hours, for the average to be close to nine, that means that 26% really had a lot of time. So screen media, for better or for worse, they're using it a lot, and we need to start thinking about, okay, how do we manage this? How do we get some temperance on there and some, some reasonableness and, and then go from there? But some of them are using it a lot, and, and we just need to be aware of that. Um, the other thing is I was surprised. I thought that the teen's favorite activity would be social media, and it's not. It really hasn't changed. It's still listening to music, watching videos, doing that kind of stuff. I was also surprised at the, at the, the survey results we found out that reading and social media are the same as listed as favorite activities. So it's good to know that reading is still high up there. Uh, while social media is important and they all do it, they don't consider it their favorite activity. It's just sort of how they communicate, so a few things there. Um, the other thing we're really looking at closely is technology addiction. And addiction is a, is a weird word because it's, it has medical meaning to it. You know? So a true addiction is a certain other kind of things, like, like cigarettes or, or that kind of stuff. Um, so what we did was when we found out, we did a, a, a lit survey out here to find out. So we actually looked at all the, all the research that was out there 
not doing our own, but looking out, out there to find out what's there. And what we found was nobody, they don't really know. They don't really know if there's a true addiction or not. There's going to be a lot of things going on. But we did pull out a couple of pieces of information that I think would be helpful here. 54% um, of the children felt their parents checked their devices too often. In other words, the view of kids towards their parents toward, about technology is sort of interesting when we talk about this addiction thing. Is it the kids? Is it the parents? And whether it's a true addiction or not, it is certainly something we need to be aware of. The other thing was that when we looked at caregivers, an observation, eating with children at fast food, the, the parents that were really absorbed in their device tended to be much harsher in the discipline as they were doing with children's misbehavior. Um, so that device on the parent thing has sort of changed those interactions. The other thing we found <laughs> is that when we looked at the parents of zero to eight-year-olds, they said, oh, they're not worried about our children being uh, addicted. You know, we're fine. The media stuff's under control. We have it all under control. So it was just interesting when people talk about that. And it'll be really interesting to see as we do our follow-up when these kids get a little older if parents still feel the same way when they're doing that. Um, and then the other thing is that we found that what seems to be like a, a, you know, immediate response connected to technology all the time is really sort of the teen's telephone today. It's really just a way of staying connected and doing that. Um, and I think that's something that we'll be looking at very closely, whether do they need these devices all the time? Is it good to unplug? I feel it certainly is. Um, for me, I find I end up working all the time. It's no longer you just work nine to five, you now work nights, you work weekends. Matter of fact, we're doing a webinar on Saturday. So we obviously are the overachievers that like to work all the time. But we need to, to, to think about our kids, what we're doing, and how we're able to do this. So from this survey, the, the big thing that we, we concluded was really we need balance. You know, we need balance. We need to make sure we're balancing tech with face-to-face. -face. We need to make sure we have a healthy lifestyle, pull away and do that kind of thing. And we'll obviously be, be conducting many more surveys and things going forward and studies to figure out what's actually going on um, through that. Um, I want to start today by saying that the Internet is really a very good thing. There are a lot of things out there, and we've found that the Internet can make your kids a lot smarter, happier place to be. Now, there's an overwhelming amount of information now. And when you think about that, there are all these stats here that are, that are just, you know, these ridiculously high numbers, and they're getting bigger fast. The one that, that spoke most to me was the fact that the information generated now in two days on the Internet is the equivalent of the amount of information generated from the dawn of civilization to 2003. So that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff that's happening out there. So we have to you know, realize this data overload thing is present and then figure out, OK, how are we going to mess with this? How are we going to do it? The other thing is that social media really has a very strong place. And there are a lot of things open for kids that weren't available for me as I was growing up. You know, the, the, you can have friendships with a lot of people that you, know, you have that connection. It's easier to connect with more than one person at a time. And then that sense of belonging. I know when I grew up, I was, you know, into model rockets. And there was really only one other kid that was into it in school. And, you know, we kind of hung together, but that was it. But now if you're into something like model rocketry or something, there's a global community. So even, even the, you know, the interests you have that are sort of not, not normal for, for the area you're in, you can really find people to connect. And it really does allow that expression and expansion of what's going out. Um, way of expression. Kids can now have a global reach. They can make a difference. We wanted to make a difference. Um, I know I wanted to make a difference as a kid, but I really didn't have the outlet to do that. And now kids do. Um, gaming's also gotten a bad rap. You know, oh, video games are bad. But the research has shown that playing video games may boost learning, health, and social skills, especially the multiplayer games is doing that, provided it happens in a, in a responsible way as we're going out. A lot of educational games that are out there that are good. So when you talk about gaming, make sure that we're, we're being clear what, you know, what skills were involved and how we can make this work positively because gaming really does have some things that are, that are, are positive. And when I look at kids doing video games now, I think, wow, they're training for something. I just don't know what it is. Um, Obviously, though, the Internet has, you know, some, some areas to be concerned about, you know, the inappropriate content, the sharing, the digital drama. Um, distraction, I think, is a big one, impersonation, that kind of. So we're going to talk about a few resources here that I think will help as you're going through this and, uh, and being able to do it. Um, 
as we realize, you know, we all have our phones on us now, and a screenshot is just one button. You can press one button and take a screenshot, which means that it's really easy to share things that you really maybe shouldn't share, you know. And I think part of the digital drama and that kind of stuff is happening just because it's so easy and, and it just happens so fast that you don't think about it. So as, as adults, as parents, as teachers, as educators, what we need to do is just be aware of how the kids are using the technology so that we can sort of be there to, as, a, as a support system for them, um, both to help guide them and then when things go a little bit awry, we can help pull things back and, and right the ship to do that. Um, growing up is a learning opportunity and mistakes are made and we have the chance to be able to say, okay, how can we learn from this or what can we do? But we need to be aware of what they're doing in order to do that. And that leads us to the persistent plus searchable digital footprint. Um, it's no longer acceptable to have no digital footprint. We found that kids are trying to stay off the grid when they go to college or apply for the workforce. There's not enough information there. If people see no information, that, that, that's not helpful at all, as well as too much information or the wrong kind of information. So as we're going through, we need to think, OK, how can we start these kids at an early age? to put this positive digital footprint out, and then also have them be thoughtful about what kind of digital footprint they want, what they want to actually show as they're going forward when they're doing that. And then why is social media so engaging? I mean, why do they just do this all the time? They're just always on their phones. They're always doing this. And I think, for me, this quote really sums it up. They, they don't get it. Adults just don't get it. I, they think I'm addicted to technology, but I'm not. I'm addicted to my friends. And when we think about it, it used to be you'd meet your friends, you'd be on the phone for all hours of the night. Maybe you had a, you could have a, a call where you could talk to two people at a time, but it was usually one. You know, you talked for a long time. And, and it's really just that, how do I belong? How do I fit in? You know, it's my connection with my friends. And, and as you know, as the generational thing moves on, if you're not on social media, you're not talking to your kids or your grandkids. So, so it's really just a way of, of Connection, and, and I think connection is so very important as we're going through. So the first thing to do is talk to kids. As a teacher, as a parent, talk to kids and say, hey, what are you doing? What are your favorite apps? Who are you talking to? You know, when do you check it? When do you use this? I think the conversations, a lot of times we just assume things are happening. We don't really know. But kids love to talk about what they're doing. They love to talk about the games they're playing. They love to talk about the newest apps. Um, as they're going in. And then we have resources at Common Sense to, to check on some of the, the other apps, the popularity, to see what's going on now so that you'll actually know what the language is, even though as adults we can never keep up. I mean, don't even, don't even try to do that. But have those conversations and say, hey, what are you doing? What are you using? What are the favorite apps? And, and, and what's the purpose of these so we can find out? And you'll find most of those are connection. You know, I want to connect with my friends or they're in there. Today it's Snapchat, tomorrow who knows what it'll be, but I'm sure it'll be something. So since all of this stuff is out there, we need to talk about how to keep kids safe. Um, first tip, be involved. Kids are gaming. As a parent, as a teacher, kids are gaming. But what you need to do is, is play, play with them, even if you don't understand the game, or watch them play, because they spend a lot of time at it. They get very good, and, and they want to show you their skills, you know? And if you show that you're, you're involved a little bit, that would be helpful too. And this is where you can have the, the conversation and say, okay, you know, in these games, I mean, as the games ramp up, there are a lot of different games out there, but you could be exposed to some of these negative things. So let's talk about what happens when these show up. Let's talk about why some of these games just aren't, aren't really appropriate for where we are as we're going through. And then also talk about why these games are so appealing when we look at that. Um, First thing you need to know about the games is that the online part is not rated. So games themselves are rated. If you get a game that's rated E, should be pretty safe for everything. However, if the online part exists, if there is an online component, that is not rated. So as a parent, you can say, oh, well, I've got a game that's rated everybody, so it should be okay. I'll just turn my kid loose on it, and it'll, it'll be fine. But if there's an online component, you need to at least be aware that that online component is not rated. And that online component where they have the interaction things happening, the chats and that kind of stuff, that could evolve into something that's not appropriate for everyone. So just be aware of that, that the online component is not rated. And then 
gaming tips for kids, a lot of times they don't understand that they have the ability, they have the right, and we encourage them, hey, if you feel uncomfortable, come talk to me. Hey, we, we can help you with these conversations, you know? And I think a lot of times growing up, I know when I was a kid, I used my parents as an excuse a lot to say, oh, yeah, uh, I'd love to do this, but, you know, my mom just won't let me, so I can't do that. And let them know that it's the same on the games. You know, somebody says, hey, we want to engage. We want to play all these games. And you say, well, I'd like to, but, you know, my, my parents either won't let me play this game or my parents, you know, they're sort of uncomfortable with this online thing. So, you know, I, I know that they're listening, so I need to be responsible doing this. So, so make sure that you're giving them things and then have them put the limit on themselves. A lot of times they don't even realize. I know my nephew came over. He got the brand new game. He and his friend played the game all day long, all day night. And then when they went to leave the house, they actually couldn't open the doorknob of the house because their thumbs were so sore that they couldn't turn the knob. And I had to actually open the door and let them out. And, and you don't even realize how much time they're spending. So talk to them, make sure that they're aware of it and say, hey, how much do you want to play this game? Or let's, let's talk together about how we can figure out a time limit for this so that you can do other things too. And then this sharing thing, you know, be careful with the sharing as you're out there because a lot of opportunities there. Then keeping personal information private. I think at an early age, we need to definitely, um, you know, sort of have these controls in place for our kids. But as they're growing up too, we need to make sure that they're aware of these location services. Now, sometimes you'll want a location service. Find my friends. I want to know where my kids are, so I'll do that. I know my mom stalks me as I drive around the country, as I'm flying around. She says, oh, I see you're in Atlanta. Um, so I turn the location thing on for that so she can know where I am. Same with our kids. We want to follow them for some things. However, you can turn locations off for specific apps. You can turn so you need to decide what, what's appropriate and what's not. But do be aware that all these pieces are out there that, that, they can, uh, that they can figure out what's going on. And when you talk about a reasonable amount of time for kids, um, I think for me that varies a lot by kid, but, but a couple of hours and then to figure out what they're doing. If they're getting their homework done, everything else is being responsible, they're participating in the family, you know, they're, you can tell they're actually having interactions outside of the game, you know, I would think you can sort of let that creep up a little bit. If you find that that's affecting what they're doing, they're not getting their homework done, they're not, they're not doing other things, you know, the game seems to be taking over, then I think it's time to, to limit that down and, and have it move up. Also, when some, a kid starts a game, usually they get excited about it and play a little bit, and it should taper off. If it doesn't taper off and picks up, then it's probably time for a conversation about, you know, you know how much time you're spending in there, and let's see what we can do. But remember that as adults, we get sucked in. I know I've seen my mother play solitaire for, you know, like seven hours straight, um, just because it's very clearing for her, her mind, and, you know, she just likes doing it, sort of a mindless type of thing. So just because somebody's playing a lot doesn't mean that they're necessarily engaged or, I mean, addicted or, or stuck in things. Um, individual apps, too, a lot of those privacy things. Make sure that, that your kids are aware of what's available and what's not, you know, especially on the social media ones where you can set things for private. You know, anything you have that's public out there, if they're posting pictures or posting something, make sure that they're aware of what group it's going to, who's actually seeing them, and there are some <laughs> safeguarding settings that you can put on to help them. Certainly don't rely on those, but but you do want to uh, to put that out. Yeah, it's funny because uh, my mother spent a lot of time. Um, my mom also, she just turned 80, and she's a, a solo handbell ringer. Sue Garden, if you look her up, handbell tapestry, she's the, one of the top ringers in the country. But she spends she spends eight hours a day on her bells, um, and as a result, she's she's one of the best in the world. But that does sort of show me that that having that kind of focus to become really good at something is also important for our kids. Because I think too often our kids today are so distracted and because of the media world we live in, they have that short attention span. So sometimes a game will give them the opportunity that they can actually focus on something for an extended period of time. And I think that's a useful skill for whatever they want to do later on in life when they figure out, well, here's what I want to do. Now I have the ability that I know I can sit in a chair for seven hours and work because I've actually done this on my game. So. Always look at that. Um, the safety tips, you know, this, this is sort of the usual thing that you've seen there. I think phishing, P-F-I-S-H-I-N-G, is something that we don't talk about often enough. In the classroom, with our kids at home, um, 
because phishing is really that email or that information thing that comes out where they're looking for you to put in some information like like hey you just won this you know sign here or you know you have a package delivered you need to click here so we can make sure that or we're depositing money in your bank you know whatever it is but the phishing schemes now are very very good so having these conversations finding a few of the of the good ones you know the worst one i saw was the the red cross thing when they had the the katrina thing and somebody put up a page that looked exactly like the Red Cross page, except there was one letter different in the address. So instead of donating $10 to Katrina victims, you were actually donating your entire bank account to whoever set this site up. So on the phishing things, I think this is really, and, and even really good tech savvy people can get taken in by some of these phishing things. So if something looks just a little bit, I mean, make sure you check it out. Start with the URL. Go online, look at other resources, but don't ever just start putting data in. If your bank sends you something or, or your kids get something, you know, say, you know, don't put anything in until we talk about it to see what's going on. The other thing is the fine print. When you're signing up for an app or doing something, it's amazing the fine print says, here's what we're going to do with your data, um, and you've given us permission to do it, and you don't even realize. Some of those fine print things are very long. And we all just click, sure, okay, we're ready to pay. We're ready to, to play this game. We're not going to spend time going through this whole thing. But do make sure you take some time and be aware. If you're putting data in, that's when you want to look and see and see what's up. Um, I think the social media and family values, I really like this stoplight sort of thing because you can have the conversation at any age. Here's what we share, no problem. You know, you can share these general pictures, do this kind of thing. Here's what we really need permission. If you're posting pictures of somebody else and you decide at what age and, and where they are, what that is, and then these are things we never want to post. We don't want to post a picture of you in, in, right in front of where you live, so then, you know, that kind of thing. So, so just having, having a conversation about what's okay, what we need to talk about, and then what's not okay um, really does make it, make it very easy then as you're going forward to have these conversations. And as the kids get older then, you can talk about how things change and, and what should be added or deleted or, or what you need to be more careful of as you're going along. Um, family media contracts are great. And we have these contracts for every age as you're going through. But I think this is where you have the conversation. Because for me, it's not about the contract. It's about the conversation where here's what I will do as a kid. Here's what I expect from you to do to help me do this kind of things. And these are the things that we've agreed on is what's going to happen. Now this works well with families and it also works great in the classroom. If you have a classroom media agreement, you know, you'd say, look, we're going to be going online a lot. I, here's what I expect from you and then here's what you can have from me and let's have this conversation. Maybe you need to modify this contract, but if the kids make the rules or help contribute, it really does make it a lot easier as enforcement comes along. This is the question I'm asked all the time for parents, for teachers to spy or not to spy. Should I? Here's the answer. It's up to you. It depends. There are a lot of different things. Remember, you have the parental rights. You have the right to do what you think is important for your kids. Sometimes that makes sense, and especially at an earlier age as they're going on. But as they get older, you do have, you say, yes, I can do that. However, here are a couple of things I think you need to make sure that you have in place, and then you can do it. It absolutely has to be transparent. Don't ever spy without them knowing. In schools, if there's something that everything's been recorded, kids need to know that. At home, if there's something and, you know, there's a key logger or something on and they're knowing that, that's okay. As a parent, you have the right to do that, but they need to know that. If you set something up sort of without them knowing it, and then you go and say, hey, I saw you were here, and they're like, how do you know that? What? Then the trust thing is there, and they're like, well, now what else are they doing and that kind of thing. So. Be transparent, let them know. And again, this is the case where, especially as you're growing up, kids need to know, you say, look, I want to help you enjoy technology. I agree, I think this is great. You know, we're going to live in a technology world, but I want to make sure that you're safe. I want to help you be safe. I want to contribute to that. And I want to give you the tools and help you be prepared. As kids are growing up, they really do need somebody to lean on. They need that excuse. When peer pressure comes in, say, hey, we want you to go to this party, and you're like, I'd like to, but my mom, you know, she just won't let me. My dad, he won't, you know, he'll kill me if I do, you know, that kind of thing. So set yourself up and make sure your kids understand that they can use you as the excuse so they can, they can see what's going on. 
And, and I think having that excuse and being transparent does make it okay. Now, obviously, you want to model the trust. You want to show them. And if you're spying, especially as they're getting older and saying, look, we're logging this, you know, have some retroactivity there and say, you know, I just want to know where you are to keep you safe, but I also want you to know where I am. So make sure that you're doing that. And, and avoid the power play because if you have the conversation and things work well, you'll be able to put these in place and say, yes, I need to know where you are. I'm, I'm sort of watching this because I just want to, you know, make sure that you're safe, do this kind of thing. But at the same time, I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, we have to do this. You know, you, you have to not do this or not do that. Because then if you, if you get into a power play, what they'll do is they'll get on other networks. They'll borrow other people's devices. They'll, then you're, you know, it'll actually be counterproductive as you start trying to lock them down too much without having the conversation. Then, then it won't be as effective because they'll just be finding ways to go around you. And as adults, even if you're tech savvy, will never be able to keep up with the kids. The other thing is the multitasking and distraction. And I think this is really key as kids are growing up and especially in schools. Um, you know, Maine's been one-to-one, -one, you know, with devices since 2001. And a lot of kids growing up in Maine went off to college and then they said, you know, I got to college and now we have unlimited bandwidth. And, and, and there were other beverages around like beer that I hadn't really had a lot of experience with, but this bandwidth thing, and my roommate got sucked in. He was, he was up all night. He was doing this kind of thing. He just, and as a result, he did really poorly in school and even flunked out and they said, hey, we learned how to manage this in seventh grade. So we need to give them the chance to do this, to develop their strategies, have this technology available when you're in school. You know, yes, you have this technology available. So how are you going to, to be able to, to address this? How are you going to be able to limit yourself? How are you going to be able to manage your time and balance what you're doing between getting distracted by YouTube videos about cats um, when you're supposed to be doing your homework? So we talked about family media agreements, but having the kids do this and then modeling it for our students, both as teachers and as parents, how can we, because if they find us getting distracted by everything, that's not really modeling for them how to do it. So we say, look, I really enjoy watching my basketball games on, on my devices, and I watch five games at a time as they're going on, and it's pretty exciting. But I realize that I, 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 it's going to take too much of my time. So I make sure and cut, carve this time off. We're going to have family time. We're going to do this thing. So model that distraction thing and give them the opportunity and let them know this is something as we're going up that we have to make sure that these kids deal with as they're, as they're getting older. Um, the good news is, is we always think, what the heck are these kids watching on YouTube? You know, they're doing all this video stuff, they're listening to music, and it turns out it's really not inappropriate stuff. It's just kind of silly stuff. You know, it's just goofy when you watch it. You're like, um, I know a lot of kids now spend a lot of time watching other kids play video games online. As a matter of fact, you can even go to these giant arenas and watch them play video games online. I mean, it's crazy. So they watch a lot of goofy stuff, and then I realize when I look at what I watch on YouTube and other, other media places, I watch a lot of goofy stuff too. You sort of get sucked in there. But it really is, it's not what we think of as like, oh, it's going some, some bad place or something. For the most part, it's just kind of, you know, goofy, different. Um, you know, and, and I've actually been able to bond with my daughters a little bit over some of the goofy stuff. I mean, who would have thought Wicked Tuna and, and Catfish would be something that you could actually really get involved in? What we've done, though, Common Sense has provided you a nice resource here to help you out. Our ratings and reviews, we've rated and reviewed movies, we've rated and reviewed games, and what we do is we give you an actual age rating. So here's where we recommend, here's why we recommend, and then here's how this, this, uh, this particular game can play out. We also rate games based on the quality of the game and then whether it should be. Like Tinder is obviously not for kids. You know, so we've rated all of these, and um, we're going to talk a little bit later about the, our glossary where we, where we tell you about what the apps are, which ones you really need to wear now, what's going on. Tinder is just not for kids. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure Tinder is really for anybody, um, but, but we, we do rate these things. And then rating games, like Grand Theft Auto, for me, I think this is it's just not a very appropriate game for anybody. That's why we rated it as 18+. Plus. Um, but why is it selling so much? It's selling so much because as far as gameplay goes, it's a pretty good game. I mean, it's, it's got 
all kinds of bad stuff in it, but the gameplay is what gets people engaged. So you need to be aware. Yeah, certainly wouldn't let kids play this thing. Certainly they need to be aware, but why are they playing it? It's because, because of the gameplay. So our ratings and reviews really help tell you, first of all, okay, why? And then also, all right, let's talk about the impact of violence in the media. What, what do you think when you see all this violence things? You know, not only going on games, but everything else. So I, I love our ratings and reviews as far as the conversation pieces that happen too. Um, and then we have a lot of privacy and things, a lot of questions. We have a whole section on parent concerns on our website that you can go to. So you can look at how to protect my kids' privacy, you know, a lot of lot of step-by-step -step and, and more detailed advice. So feel free to jump on there and look at all that good stuff that's there. We also have um, print, you know, whether you're reading this now on your new technology device and your Kindle or your iPad or you actually have a paper copy in front of yourself, uh, we do list a lot of good reads that are out there um, as they're, as they're, uh, as they're growing up and, and resources for parents to be able to do that. Um, a ton of videos too. We have a lot of videos to watch where you can see cyberbullying things. You can see these things from kids' point of views, from, from parents' point of views. And then <clears throat> what can we do about it? So there are a lot of things out there. We have a ton of resources out there that you can look at and have those going on. And this is one of my favorite ones. Um, if we had time today and, <clears throat> and weren't on a, a remote thing, we'd play this video with, with Ellen pulling out audience members' Facebook pages and talking about them. And it's while it's very funny, it's also very pointed in that, well, wait a minute, all this stuff's available. And when she talks about how, well, you know, somebody says, oh, my friend probably hates me now for, for showing this. And Ellen says, well, yeah, a lot of people have seen it now because now suddenly millions of people have seen this thing out there. And the conversations and watching the videos like that and having this available um, to have the discussion about, well, what do you have posted out there? You know, is there anything that, you know, you might be a little uncomfortable with your mom sitting in the audience as you're looking at this kind of thing as it's going out there? And then digital citizenship, um, both in, this, in the classroom and in the home, I think are really critical, but we need to do it from a positive point of view. Remember the positive, the building community, the safe, searching effectively and safely as you're doing this, evaluating credibility, copyright, you know, cultivating a positive, if you think of a positive approach, it's a lot better than saying, don't do this. Absolutely, we need to avoid risky situations. Absolutely, you need to make sure that you're protecting your privacy, figuring out what's going on. But remember that the reason we're doing this is because we are digital citizens, whether we like it or not. We are part of this digital world, and we need to make sure that we're giving our kids the tools to be good citizens, not just say, well, okay, what can we do about being safe? Um, we have a ton of stuff. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are probably aware of us now. I think we're in 65% of the schools already. Um, but we have digital citizenship curriculum, K-12. to It's all free. It's all wonderful. It's amazing. And what we do is units one, two, and three, like if you look at the K through two, that's not kindergarten, first grade, second grade. It's really just a unit that you can choose where to put in. And we don't put any grade bands on our stuff. So for example, if you wanted to use a second grade thing in your third grade, go ahead. It doesn't say grade two on it, so your third grade is going to say, oh, well, this is baby stuff. We're going to do that. Um, it, it, there are no grades on it, so you can use it wherever. What I'd recommend if you haven't done this is choose, you know, of our eight topics, choose one or two that you think, okay, this is what I'd like to start with. Then look at some units that are there because it can be overwhelming if you try and put this thing. And we have all of all this information in a very age-appropriate way. So well, I'm very quickly, I'm just going to go through one of these. So digital footprint and reputation, as we go through this from an age appropriate, we have curriculum materials all the way from kindergarten up to 12th grade. So at the early elementary, K2, really what we need to do is we're, we're talking to them about, talking to them about here's, here's what you need to do, here's safety. So it's really more telling them things. And I love this following the digital trail because you can actually do this physically too, where you're walking on a trail, you have on a trail, but talking about, okay, here's what it's okay to share. It's okay to share your favorite food is cheese, but it's not okay to post a picture of yourself in front of your house. So you do that kind of thing. So early elementary, we're really sort of telling them and guiding them. And we have a lot of really cute videos and things, you know, singing, because kids love to sing. Kindergarten first, oh man, they love. My daughter's first grade teacher and they just sing all the time. So we got some really cool songs here on digital citizenship that's wonderful. Upper elementary then, we want to get them into 
creating stuff because I think the student creating for the safety thing is really what makes a difference. So super digital citizen, create your own super digital citizen, write some things, make some things, they're creating things so they're actually contributing to the, the digital citizenship. Then when we get up in the middle school and start moving into high school, this is really where we have the gray areas, the conversation. A trillion dollar footprint, you have to choose a host for a game show based on the social media profiles that you find. You've got Lynn and Jason, and both of them have issues. They have things you're like, hmm, why would I do that? Jason has uh, one thing he's married, one thing he's single. I mean, what does that mean? So the conversations that happen about that where you have to pick one are very good. And then the high school level, the college found when you're getting there, this is really, what do I want my footprint to be like? What do I want, how do I want to appear to the world when I'm out there? And how can I make a difference in the world? So we have a lot of good resources out there. All of them are free, so go for that. Um, I, I get a lot of questions about parental controls and blocking and all that kind of stuff. And there are things out there that you can do. Just remember that the, all of these are just things to sort of help you. It's really like a seat belt in a car to help you. Um, so that if you're in an accident, you know, you'll be better prepared to do that. However, you know, the biggest parental control is the one between their ears. You know, how are we going to actually filter this? How are we going to stop this? What are we going to do as we're, as we're going out there? Um, because there are, no, there are very few technological things you can put in place that kids can't get around. I mean, they can Google, how do I get past this filter that you put in place? And there'll be 27 things to do that. Obviously, we want more controls at an early age. And as they get a little older, we'll have to relax us a little bit. And feel free to have them in place as long as you have a conversation. But just make sure that you're having those conversations so that they know they know what's there and they're going on. Um, we also have student interactives, which are great as a parent. They're great in the classroom. We've got elementary, or, um, elementary where we've got uh, three to five. This, these are game type things. They're, they're games that we have a badging system for them. They cover topics. It's a sort of a game thing on digital citizenship. Very fun to play. Uh, Compass in the middle school, we had a heck of a time deciding on these character icons to do this, to have this set up, because we just had so many um, ways to figure out how can we have a character identify with these traits like oversharing or bullying and stuff like that without seeming stereotypical. It was, it was a challenge to have that up. But anyway, this is a choose your own adventure thing where you know you choose the different endings. And we encourage kids to do different innings as they're doing it. The one thing we found is, is kids love this. They get in there. And even if they say, if they're older kids and say, ah, eh, this is kind of cartoon based, we find they really get in there and do it. The one thing is, is we have all these different stories, eight characters. And if you assign one, don't be, don't be surprised if they do all of them. So the only, the only difficulty we found is if you, you say, okay, we're going to do the one this here, and then we're going to do this one later. And then you find, oh, they've already done it, and they don't want to do it again. So we're going on that. And then digital bytes for 9 through 12, this is really the, the extension of what's going on. A lot of creation things for them. And I really like this, this, we've broken them into innovation, our generation, activism, and interpretation. Kids now can make a difference in the world. They can make a difference in the world right now where we really couldn't do that because they have this platform to do it. I mean, I mean they really can, and we need to allow that and show them that, yes, you can have a much bigger impact on, on, on what's happening in the world by putting that out there now. So there's that. And then the last thing I really want to talk about today is, is connecting families. And we have this whole resource for, for family, family things that you can have out there where, uh, where we have materials for parents. Our digital glossary is very, very good. They try and uh, keep that up about every 12 minutes. They update that. Um, so the glossary is there for the terms that you like. What are the kids even talking about? All the, Acronyms are there telling you what they are, um, the good and the bad, so it's all there. And then, and then uh, the family meeting agreement and then the parent blog, so it's out there as well as tons of, of videos. So make sure you check out the Connecting Families resources, both as a parent and as a teacher. There are a lot of really good resources that you can use there when you're, when you're helping with your school. So it really is an amazing world out there now, and it's amazing how, how people just get you know, hung up and uh, just uh, so much going on, I can't do, you know, we need to make sure that, that we know that our kids have the opportunities that they didn't have and let them know that we're there to help them as they navigate through this. And as a matter of fact, it's also important for them to be there to help us navigate because I know all too often in the classroom, 
I have a kid do something, I say, how do I do this? How do I actually connect to Blackboard since it's giving me this Java error? And it will, it'll, some kid will say, oh, here's what you do. So make sure that you're going on this journey together and let them know that we're right there with them because they still, they, they want to know what we think, they want to know that we care, and they want to know what's going on. So I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity today. If you want future uh, resources, um, I'm on Twitter, although since I'm, I'm an old guy, I don't tweet a lot, um, and there's my email right there. And I think we'll move into questions and answers now uh, to see what you have to say. So thank you so much for this time today. Thanks so much, Steve. Yes, I did capture questions. And if anybody has any other questions, please feel, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, is the information about kids being smarter, happier, et cetera, part of the research on the com Common Sense site, what you had earlier in your um, presentation? Right. Yes, it is. And this is really a compilation of a lot of things that they found out there because a lot of people are now concerned about, well, is this really a detrimental thing? And showing that there are a lot of positive uh, pieces that are out there. We do have some of the links if you've got our research section on common sense. I especially like Ruben Puentadura's uh, work. He's done a lot of really good work out there about, about technology both in the classroom and in the home and how it really does sort of extend the human mind and, and give kids uh, the opportunity to actually work conceptually with pieces that are beyond their ability to do, um, you know, what they can do without the technology, especially in the areas of, of math and extension. Great. Uh, since sharing is so spontaneous, what are the best ways to teach kids how to make that how to make that instantaneous decision so they <laughs> use it? And, 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 that, and that's a good point. And that whole prefrontal, prefrontal cortex yeah. not being developed, I think, right. is a, a big question because, you know, for women it, it sort of solidifies in the early 20s, and for men the jury's out, but it probably never really totally mm -hmm. solidifies there as you're going out. So um, for me, that's where the family media agreement and where you have to talk about this ahead of time. Having that red light, green light, yellow mm -hmm. light so that when spontaneous decisions come up, they are spontaneous, but you've also prepared them for that ahead of time. So you've had that discussion, and they have some sort of benchmark that they can actually use spent spontaneous things against as they're going forward. And then the other part is to make sure that kids understand, yeah, you're going to be making some impulse decisions, and you know, I certainly still do at my age as we're going on. But when, think about before you do anything, what are the repercussions? You know, what are my friends going to think? Is this really going to be helpful? Am I going to hurt somebody? That kind of thing. So having those conversations ahead of time really sets up for that impulse type of thing um, with a lot of background and, and makes it much easier. Good. If you turn on privacy for photos on Instagram, doesn't that eliminate all of your sharing because it's all based on images? Um, well, and Instagram, when you talk about any particular app, it sort of changes from week to week what it can actually do and what, it, and, and what it doesn't do. But Instagram mm -hmm. also has, the, there's a text only piece, so you, you can do that. The main thing is on things like that is to make sure that you're only sharing with your group. So, mm -hmm. so don't just share and post them to the world or be very aware of what groups you're posting to. And I think when we're talking to our kids, it's like, Okay, you're sharing with who, and what are you sharing? So have them look at the app and say, now what, where is this really going to? If I'm posting this on Instagram, is this going out? Is, am I sharing it with a wide group? Am I sharing it with one person? So be aware of where it's going. And that's where looking at the settings to see where it's actually going when I click this that, that makes the difference. Otherwise, a lot of times kids will think they're sending it to one person, and, and they'll send it to the world, um, especially something like Twitter or something like that where right. they respond to something and go, oh, it's only going to one person. Well, no, you just actually said that to the world. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there an article in the Common Sense site about the stoplight points that you mentioned, that is the photos and what can, what can be safely posted? Yes. Yes, I believe that's in the parent section. Um, I don't know specifically where it is, but I'm sure we could find that and then post it in the the a live binder. Okay. Uh, and, and that's part of the, the media agreement section, I believe. So right. yeah, just look up stoplight and it should be there. Somebody asked, uh, did you see the 60 Minutes show on 
Brian hacking about methods used to hook people on their phones? I did not, but I do know that there's a whole lot. I mean, it, that falls for me under the whole phishing category of, mm -hmm. of you know, all this conversation. And I think that's that. That to me is the biggest issue that we have now. Are all these very deceptive pieces that are going out there? You know, not only internet links you click on. You know, the whole mm -hmm. clickbait thing where you know you look like you're going someplace and you end up going someplace else. But the the true deception, both in messages. And it's extended to phone. I mean, we've always had phone calls where someone will call your home and say, "Hey, this is the IRS," you know, and you oh, and you're like, "Oh, so you know, start singing your bank numbers or you're going to jail," that kind of thing. Um, it's just extended into every single medium. So our kids just need to be aware wherever there's communication. Let's talk about this phishing thing. And let's talk about coercion and you know, trying to be driven into these things. If a high school student decides they don't like what their digital footprint shows when applying for college or jobs, what can they do to change it either before about prior posts or future posts? <laughs> well, and, and hopefully you start going through this whole process when you think about it. But you're right. You always find out there's something there. And what you can do really is just sort of do a step-by-step -step type of thing. The biggest problem I found isn't really what you post because you can just go say, all right, I'll take this down or I'll start mm -hmm. changing it or I'll move things around. But when you've posted things out there, now it's linked to other places. So now something right. you posted that maybe you don't want out there, it's on five other places. So then you have to start sort of trying to track it down. Um, in extreme cases, there are services you can use which will actually go out there and erase pieces from the Internet. Um, it can be expensive, but there are things out there. But for the most part, really just start with your piece and then make sure that you know your friends look for the links out there. Search yourself. Kids should absolutely search themselves on a regular basis. Find out what's there. And not just use Google, but use some of the other search engines too <laughs> and find out what's there. And if you do find something, contact that person and say, you know, uh, could you mind taking this down or, or you know, I'm applying for colleges and you know, that picture of me drinking at that high school party when I was 12 years old is probably not something I really want to have out there. So, you know. Sure. Uh, back to Instagram. Can someone in your group share what you share with somebody else that's not in the group? Yes, they can. Um, they can. Right. Yes, they can. Right. And, and that, well, well, when you have you know, depending on how things are set up, and again, things like things like Instagram, all these sharing apps, you know, they really change week to week what settings mm -hmm. do, what happens. I mean, they're they're updated all the time. But but something that you share with somebody, that person can always share that with somebody else, and that's right. what we need to teach our kids. You know, to sort of be careful. You are sharing it with one person, but then that person can share it with anybody they want, or you can think you're sharing it with just one person, and mm -hmm. then you're not. So. They just need to be aware of that. What, what I think of is, you know, since I was a federal bureaucrat in Maine, anything that I put in any device at all, I think, is this okay if it shows up on the front page of the paper? And I think everybody sort of has their own version of that. You know, anything I put, do I want this showing up in front of my mom? Would this be okay with my teacher? You know, just to do that because there's no such thing as total privacy on any of these apps on the internet. What we need to do is focus on keeping it contained. So I'm aware, I'm not sending this to the world, I just want to send it to one person, so I'm, I'm trying to limit where it's going. But realizing it can go anywhere. Is there a service or app which gives a teacher access to the student's laptop screens in a classroom while they are working? Yes, there are. Um, there are a bunch of them like Land School and those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. I've found though in my experience with a lot of schools that those really don't don't help. They sort of cause more more trouble because then as a teacher you end up spending more time trying to police right. um, and, and, and less time teaching and interacting with the kids. And then you start relying on that. Like if you have something that's up there. As a teacher though, you know. You can just look up and tell when some kids someplace where they shouldn't be even if you can't see their screen. But you're much better off arranging your classroom in a way so that so that you know, sort of have the screens in the middle, so that at any point someone can look up and see where somebody is. Kids will always, there's always a reaction when a kid goes somewhere where they shouldn't be that you can always see. And I found that it's much more effective to use that than to use, you know, something that can capture screens. 
Um, for me, the more important piece is to teach the students how to do a screen capture. So if something weird does show up or something sent, somebody sends them an appropriate thing, they know how to capture that so that you can document that and have that available, as opposed to you trying to do it. Because you'll never be able to, to track what's going on. You know, to try and manage screens is, is you know, really difficult to do. Now, some of these things do have, you know, some positive things you can do. Like if you want to share your screen with everybody that's out there, that's wonderful. One of the most effective use I've had of monitoring was where they had one where it went to a random screen at a random time and you never knew. So at any point a kid's screen could be, you know, projected on the wall up there, you know, that kind of thing. But to try and monitor, I found, is a very, it, 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 it's, it really makes it more difficult than actually relying on your teacher instincts. Great. Well, you provided us with a lot of very, very valuable information, Steve. Thanks so much for presenting today. Thank you I'm very much. Gonna, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up. Thank you so much, Steve. That was just fantastic information. I can't wait to get the recording up so we can share it with the people who weren't able to join us today. But we really appreciate that. Well, we have some great shows coming up next week. Desiree Alexander is coming back, and she's going to do a whole show on how to use video, especially video creation with your students. She's calling it not your grandmother's video. And then on May 6th, we have a great new program to learn about called Choose to be Nice. And Dina Krieger is going to come and share with us about that. May 13th, we have an all-star group. Paula Nagel, Billy Krakauer, and Jerry Blumengarten, who you probably know as Cyberry Man, are coming to share all kinds of ideas about ways to connect your students with the world. So I hope you'll come back for that. On May 20th, we have a children's author coming to share all kinds of literacy lessons that she has learned along the way while she was an artist in residence. May 27th, we won't have a show because that's Memorial Day weekend in the United States. And then on June 3rd, Mark Moran is going to join us to give us all the latest updates on the Sweet Search Engine, which has been totally revamped and is an awesome safe place for kids to search. And also uh, some updates about Choose to Matter. So I hope you'll come back and join us any Saturday you can. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it's free. You can also nominate a teacher at this site. Uh, the site's also in the resources part of the Live Finder um, every month. Usually there's a featured teacher of the month. You can also nominate yourself for this as well. The video collection for recordings is on iTunes U. As you exit the session, the link for or the a browser tab should open with the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. You can also take the link from the chat box or the tab in the Live Finder. When you complete the survey at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your name, thanks to Patty Ruffin. Um, and make sure you have this sent to a personal email address and not your school email, because schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks to Steve Garten, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks. Thanks.